I make it 7.30. The Lord be with you. Tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day. And the prayer for St. Patrick is this. Almighty God, who in your providence chose your servant Patrick to be the apostle of the Irish people, keep alive in us the fire of the faith he kindled and strengthen us in our pilgrimage towards the light of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Irish, of course, believe that they save civilization. And there are uh, elements of truth in that. There is a book you can buy which was written, I think, by an Irishman that has that title. Last week, we began in Jerusalem with 12 apostles. It was 11. Uh, one had died. Uh, Judas committed suicide. And then he was replaced with Matthias. And off they went, and the church began to grow, and it had some struggles. And last time, we came to a council at Chalcedon on the shores of Turkey, what was then Asia Minor, opposite from Constantinople, as was uh, and Istanbul today. A council which restated the fact that Jesus was both God and man. Because following Jesus isn't something that just happened then, it's something that continues today. At a similar time to the Council of Chalcedon, Patrick was working his way round Ireland, uh, apparently casting out snakes and telling people about Jesus. And the Celtic communities were often set up, the Christian communities, outside the communities that existed. An Irish society uh, at that time, sort of 1,500 years ago, would have sort of communities rather than cities. It was different because they never had the straight roads that we had here because the Romans never went there. But the, the Christians would set up a little community outside of the regular community and they would grow things and they would offer healing through uh, prayer but also through using the natural world and the many things that we have today you and I know that they can make us better. Uh, nettle tea is quite good for things, uh, let alone all the things that are found deep within rainforests or sometimes even in our gardens that are good for us. If you like a bit of peppermint tea to sort of help your digestion, how simple, you know. Uh, so uh, the Celtic church, of which Patrick was a part, used to operate close to the communities that existed and through their witness and through their love, and welcoming people in, showing them hospitality, other people would become Christians as well. Some of the doctrinal disputes that took place further eastwards, yes, they touched the Irish church, but they were more interested in sort of the imagery of, of, of life. So, for example, the lovely Celtic sort of uh, swirls that you have. Has anyone got any Celtic earrings on today or a little necklace? You know how they go. Uh, and obviously, uh, the little Celtic idea of the shamrock that represents the Trinity, possibly. It's, it's a fairly close analogy. So, the Celtic church was growing, and from the Celtic church in Ireland, a little band of travellers head off to Scotland uh, under the leadership of Columba. Uh, Columba sets up a community in Iona, and some of you may have been there. Anyone been to Iona? Uh, it's quite bleak up there, isn't it, Barbara? Very bleak. Uh, but they set up their base, and they went out, and they told the Picts, primarily those Scottish tribes, about Jesus. And many of them became believers. One of those who became a believer went down to Lindisfarne on the Northumbrian coast, a man called Aidan, and he began to share the faith in Northumbria and working his way down the northeastern coast. While that was happening, the bishop in Rome saw, and the, the story is that he saw some angelic children, uh, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and said, where are they from? They're like angels. And somebody said, well, they come from angel land, England. Uh, he said, well, we need to go and tell them about Jesus. Forgetting, of course, that there was already a Christian presence here, up in the north primarily, 
and on the fringes, Cornwall, Wales, and obviously Ireland, as well as Scotland. So he sends a group of people under the leadership of Augustine, not Augustine of Hippo, who'd lived a few hundred years before, but another chap called Augustine, sometimes Augustine of Canterbury. He goes with a gang. They travel from Rome across Gaul, which is France, and got fed up. They didn't really want to come. You know, the further north you get, it gets wet, drizzly, cold. You think, why do I want to go there when I could bask on the beach in Marseille, you know, and, and sip a pastis? So he went back, and, and the Pope said, no, you're the man that God has called to go to England. And so he crosses the English Channel uh, and arrives, and they say Augustine's Cross is near, uh, up near Pegwell Bay, isn't it? Uh, so it's not far away. And he goes and he meets the king. Uh, the king, very wisely, has a Christian wife. And, uh, and she's already sort of sowed the seed. Uh, she is uh, a Gaul uh, and comes from a sort of a Christian background. Uh, and so that the, the king hears Augustine's message and said, yep, I like that idea. Uh, right, you, you lot, my tribe, we're all going to be baptized. So they baptize them. Uh, he was the one in charge, so they all did it. Uh, it was a mass sort of baptism, and the kingdom of Kent becomes Christian, and then they move on across the country. Just before that, uh, just to go back a few years, a uh, similar time to Patrick, uh, there was, in the middle of Italy, near a place called Monte Cassino, uh, a man called Benedict, and Benedict was influenced by some of the monks who had travelled up the Nile and set up monastic communities, places that weren't the world, that weren't like the cities and the towns where lots of dreadful things happened. You know, they'd be a, a nice, holy Christian community. And people like Anthony set up these communities only to realise that they would take with them some of the things that actually they were trying to escape from. Because a lot of the things as Jesus said quite rightly, that cause us trouble, don't come from outside, they come from within. Anyway, Anthony had his groups of, of monastic uh, Christians up the Nile. Benedict sets up his own monastery on Monte Cassino, and those who follow him uh, follow the rule of St. Benedict. And there are still those that follow that today, uh, role, rules of uh, things like stability, for example. So that's, that's sort of, you have a group of, uh, of monks, monastic folk who've shut themselves away from the world. The Celts, on the other hand, as I said, prefer to be much more integrated. So you've got two different approaches to engaging with your faith in the world. Uh, the monastic, which sort of shuts yourself away, which is sort of more Roman, and the Celtic, which is much more engaged with the world. Unfortunately, they didn't mesh very well. So you've got Augustine coming up from the bottom, you've got the Celts of Aden and Cuthbert coming down from the north, and not only did they do things differently, including haircuts. Uh, and I look out and see different people having different haircuts, but it was really important that, uh, that if you were a, a Christian leader, you had your particular tonsure. Did you shave the top of your head or the side of your head? And uh, it mattered a great deal, apparently. Uh, and so there was debate over that. There was also debate over the date of Easter, because Easter is based on a lunar canal calendar rather than a solar calendar, yep, uh, because we always have Good Friday. Uh, and the Celts held it on one day, and the Roman Church, which of course held sway over most of Western Europe, said, no, it's going to be on a different date. Uh, further east you go, they have a different date for, for Christmas and Easter as well, don't they? Uh, which is why you have an Orthodox Christmas and Easter slightly later as well. So calendars matter, but here in England there was a little bit of a problem. So you had the Celtic dates and the Roman dates, the Roman haircuts and the Celtic hair, haircuts, and they met. The leaders of the church, the bishops, gathered in Whitby, because there's good fish and chips up there, and a uh, and they met at an abbey. Uh, the abbess was a lady called Hilda, or Hild, and she was a formidable woman. And she banged their heads together uh, and said, we're going to do it the Roman way. And everyone said, yes, ma'am. Uh, and so ever since, uh, even the Celtic church, which sort of became the British church, and the southern Roman part of that, 
held Easter and celebrated it at the same date, uh, and then also had similar haircuts, allegedly. And you could find a good barber, that was. As well as bringing the gospel to the southern counties again, because after the Romans had left, uh, you know, various groups came across the North Sea, uh, many of them pagan, uh, and therefore the Christian community was, was really quite small. Uh, there may have been one or two Christians who would live in the woods and the forests, but they were ripe, certainly that the large areas of population and the tribes en masse were not Christian. So with Augustine coming, these things began to sort of become rooted again. There was no structure to it. Uh, the missionaries, the saints of old, would go out and they would tell people about Jesus and people would either say, I like that idea, yep, uh, you're telling me that was a guy who lived at the far end of the empire uh, 700 years ago, died for my sins. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, but uh, you mean there was a sacrifice. I know about sacrifice, and he was a sacrifice for sin. I know about sin, um, yeah, and that means I can have forgiveness, and I don't need to earn it, I can just receive it. I like that idea. Uh, so I don't have to actually do, well, you do have to do something, but not to earn it. But once you've earned it, then you can begin to act as if you've received God's love and forgiveness. Okay, that's, that's a nice idea, I like that. So, people became Christians for whatever reason, whether it was the king of an area said, yep, you're all going to become Christians, or whether individuals came to see through other Christians that their lives were different and they weren't living in fear. Uh, maybe it was a, a wonder that happened, maybe somebody was healed, or a child was, was raised back to life. And some of these are associated with Patrick's life, or Columbus' life, or Barinus' life, or Cuthbert, for example. So, people came to faith, and the more people came to faith, the more they gathered to worship. And Theodore, who becomes the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, at the beginning of the 8th century, after Augustine and a couple of other archbishops, begins to lay down a pattern across the country, a parish system, basically an area that has a priest attached to it. Sometimes they had a minster, they'd have one church and then lots of little churches around it that would be looked after by the minster and the priests that were there. And sometimes if you needed to know the outskirts of your parish uh, on Rogation Sunday, uh, which is sort of the, the, the opposite side of Harvest Festival, uh, you'd take all the people, mainly the young boys, you'd march them around the edge of the parish and... Well, they say beating the bounds. I'm not sure whether they beat the boys or just said, right, that's the edge of the parish. And, and that was sort of revived in the 19th century just to remind people. But by then, the, the parish system had moved because transport had come in, canals and, and railways and whatever. But the idea of a parish was really something that was set up by a man called Theodore, Theodore of Tarsus. And we haven't had an archbishop from Tarsus since. We've had one from Wales recently, uh, but no one from Tarsus uh, so that was, that was happening. Uh, the parish system was beginning to develop along with the diocese, a group of parishes, uh, and then you'd have a cathedral as the mother church of each diocese. And of course, we have Mothering Sunday uh, coming up this coming Sunday when we remember Mother Church, and for us, it's Canterbury. While this is happening, a warlord, a prophet, a man arises in Arabia. Born in 570, uh, he takes the best of what he sees in Judaism and Christianity. He sees a fair amount of sort of pagan worship and idol worship. He says, I don't like that. I like the idea of one God. Uh, and, you know, this, this sort of turning the other cheek malarkey, no, that's not very good. You know, well, let's, let's stand up for our faith. Uh, let's say there's only one God, and come and join with me. And he takes his tribe, and they begin to take over other tribes, uh, and they become successful warriors, and they take over the Middle East. Uh, and they say there is on, only one God, la uh, ilaha al-Akbar, there is no God but God, and God is great. Islam, because its, it's focus is on one God, as opposed to Christianity, which is on one God who is three and yet one, begins to take the dominant place, not only in the Middle East, but right across North Africa, which had, until that particular point, been 
primarily Christian. Why did it collapse so quickly in North Africa? We don't know precisely, but some of the reasons could be the fact that there was quite a lot of infighting in the church. Uh, There had been times of religious persecution. And during one particular persecution, which was quite vehement, many of the leaders had said, you were told, right, you can either convert, well, it wasn't so much conversion, it was sort of you, you'd renounce your faith and you'd go back and worship the gods of old. This was while Rome was beginning to collapse, the Roman Empire in the West was collapsing. Uh, so you would have persecution, they blame the Christians, the Christians would be told, stop being a Christian or you die. Oh, okay, I'll stop being a Christian. Well, if you happen to be a bishop or a priest and you said, oh, I'll stop being a Christian, uh, rather than dying, and many people did die for their faith, they, they had the courage of their convictions, but others didn't, uh, and that's, I mean, that's, that's the nature of human beings, not everyone's very brave, I'm not sure if somebody said, you know, stop being a Christian or I'm going to kill you, uh, I don't know what I'd do, I mean, I have a responsibility, if I was a single man, maybe I'd say yes, but as a husband, as a father, uh, as a grandfather, you know, I've got that responsibility. So there was that time when there was a lot of persecution and some people said, yes, we'll stop being Christians and others died for their faith. When the persecution stopped, those people wanted to come back into the church because they, they still believed, really. They just said they were stopping being Christians so they didn't want to be persecuted. But those people who'd stayed firm to their faith, who might have, you know, had an arm or a, a leg cut off or an ear or something, said, you can't come back in. You know, you, you, you renounced your faith. Why should we let you back in? Forgetting that Jesus talks about forgiveness, doesn't he? Uh, and people being restored. So there's, there's a lot of sort of infighting in North Africa, particularly over those, and, and it's called the Donatist controversy. Uh, and it, it really impacted upon the church, and they, the church continued to fight. So you'd have groups of those that said, well, we still we want to be Christians again. And they said, no, you can't, because you're not proper Christians. Uh, and along comes Islam that doesn't have these internal debates because within Islam, you know, it's, it's, it's the will of Allah, you've got your five pillars, you follow those, done deal. There's none of this, this theological debate. Islam also says, you know, you can convert or you can pay a tax and you can remain Christian, but you certainly can't tell other people about Jesus. Uh, and that, that became popular. Uh, so Islam takes North Africa by by the sword and by storm, and the Christians in North Africa disappear, primarily. Yes, there might have been a few pockets, and yet you had great theologians, people like, let's say, Tertullian and and Augustine of Hippo, who'd written lots and lots of stuff and really been sort of involved in the foundations of Christianity in those early centuries. Those places, you know, disappeared. Of course, the backdrop to this was the weakening of Rome's power. Um, obviously, they'd left, not obviously, but they'd left the English shores. They left Richborough and sailed out in the 5th century. And gradually, the empire got more and more sort of, uh, sort of condensed. And you had Goths and Visigoths and Ostrogoths and, uh, and then a few Huns turned up and a few Vandals. And, and Rome was sacked a few times, burnt a bit. And it never returned to its greater glories. But in the east, because the Roman Empire used to go all the way around the Mediterranean, you had a big city, Constantinople, named after Constantine, who'd been the emperor who had really embraced Christianity. So you've got this place, this second Rome, which hasn't been conquered, it's got great big walls. Some of you might have been to, to Istanbul and seen them. To, even today, the walls are quite impressive. You've got the largest church in the world at the time, Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom. That begins to take prominence from Rome. So you've got Rome, which is sort of being attacked, and the, and the popes are just sort of weak figures. And then you've got Constantinople, which is full of, of majesty and colour and uh, great big armies. And the Byzantians, as they were known, continued to have vast armies and were fairly effective. They lost a few battles. I mean, uh, Manzikert wasn't a particular success. But Constantinople became the place where you had the patriarch of the Orthodox Church. 
and he liked to see himself as the first amongst equals with the Pope in Rome. And fair enough, uh, the, the power that Rome had had, had gone. You probably know about the rise of the Normans, the men from the north. Uh, they based themselves initially in Normandy, funny, uh, Normans, Normandy, uh, just across the channel for us. Uh, but they were ferocious fighters, uh, and obviously uh, from them came William the Conqueror. Uh, but it didn't help that they also only had a small bit of land in Normandy. So the younger sons would go off on adventures. Well, they weren't really adventures, they were sort of pirates and mercenaries. They'd do killing and they'd ride great big charges, and they were very effective. And they based themselves in southern Italy. Some of them. Others would sell themselves out to the highest bidder. In the middle of the 11th century, you have a great big sort of mess, a melee. And the Pope in Rome needs some allies. The, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, which was really quite small then, Henry, sends over a, a delegation to Constantinople, please come and help us against these nasty Normans. The trouble is, the delegates from Rome really weren't very good at being delegates and diplomats. Diplomacy was not the order of the game. So they fall out with each other over sending troops, but they also begin to fall out with each other over what they perceive to be doctrine. You may have, anyone ever heard of the filioque? It's not a dish that you can get at Aspendos, I'm afraid, but uh, it's to do with the procession of the sun. Uh, so when we talk about uh, the creed, the Nicene Creed, talking about uh, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, the Eastern Church says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. It's a bit like the debate over the nature of Jesus' divinity and humanity. Some of it's linguistic, Greek and Latin. They don't quite mesh. They don't quite mean the same things. Uh, and I think it's, isn't it true in French? Anyone speak French here? If you say, je suis plein, or I'm, I'm full at the end of a meal, you have to be careful because it might mean you're saying you're pregnant, uh, which, is, which is fine if you are, but it's not quite the same. Similar words, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of perhaps I'm doing them a, a service and saying, yeah, if they'd been able to speak the la same language, they wouldn't have fallen out. But in 1054, there is a, a, one almighty split. They excommunicate each other. They say, oh, you're not Christians. No, you're not Christians. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. And so you have the Church of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, and then you have the Orthodox Church, uh, one based in Rome and say, one based in Constantinople. Just prior to that, in 1010, you will see over in the corner of the church, we have an old stone font. God bless Alfage, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, who was hacked to death by the Danes. Uh, well, why did they do that? Well, they would sail over the North Sea, they'd grab whoever they could, particularly important people, or people they thought were important, and they'd say, give us some money, give us a ransom, and we'll give them back to you. And it was a really good money spinner. It still goes on today. Let's not kid ourselves. It's, it's, it's fairly rife, both in African states and also in the Middle East. People are held to ransom. Alfred was held to ransom, but he said, look, if you pay the ransom, they'll only come back for more. My life is hidden with Christ in God. If I die, I'm going to go to heaven. You know, I'm the Archbishop of Canterbury, but I'm also putting my trust in Almighty God, not just my position. Well, his refusal to be ransomed made the Danes who'd captured him really, really cross. They got into a drunken rage and hacked him to death. Before he died, well not, but a few, a few years before he died, he dedicated the font that we have. Not here in River, but at St. Mary Magdalene Church in Canterbury. But the vicar of River in 1875 decided when they were making the church in Canterbury redundant, oh, that's an ancient font, we'll have that over here. So how on earth he does it? Maybe on the back of a cart. Uh, the train was probably just here, between here and Canterbury. Uh, brought it down to River, and it's been here in River Church ever since. So that was in 1010. And I say in 1054, uh, the eastern and western parts of the church split. 
I would be remiss if I didn't mention as well, uh, during the 9th century, uh, there was a king who unified most of southern Britain. He's the only king or queen who we refer to as the great. It is, of course, Alfred. Uh, allegedly, he burnt the cakes uh, when he was running away. Uh, but he was able to bring the country together to fight against those who've invaded us. He set up sort of a system of Dane law, so those north of, of the border, which sort of ran approximately uh, sort of east-west from sort of East Anglia over to Chester, uh, those north of that were involved in Dane law and those south of that were part of Great Britain. Uh, but he was also a clever chap. He introduced cities that paid tax that also raised militia that would be able to defend themselves if they were ever attacked by those coming across the sea. He was also a man of God, and he translated some of the Bible into English. Old English, uh, but Thomas, you could probably read some of that. Is that have, uh, So Old English, uh, which Alfred translated the Bible into from Latin, why? Because he wanted people to know the stories of Jesus, the Psalms of the Old Testament, that they too might have a faith. I say, as well as uh, establishing the kingdom, uh, which existed right up until Harold Goodwinson, really, uh, and the death of Edward the Confessor, um, and then obviously William the Conqueror comes across the channel. Uh, and when he comes, he likes the parish system. It's very good for control. He also, uh, the feudal system has already worked with thanes and whatever, uh, and and earls and all that good stuff with the hierarchy. But the, the Normans really used it to, to control the people, as well as going throughout the land and taking notes because they wanted to tax everybody. I think a thousand years ago, the chancellor was taxing people. Oh, nothing changes, awful. Uh, but what's the name of the book? The Doomsday Book. Doomsday relates to the end of the world. Judgment Day. Uh, and there was a real concern because during the millennium a thousand years ago, they thought the world was coming to an end. There had been the rise of Islam. Jerusalem had been taken over by Muslim hordes. People still lived there, but of course the Jews had been kicked out by the Romans a thousand years before that. Some of them had continued to live there, but there was no sort of a major organization, so they were dominated by the Egyptians or the Persians until the rise of Islam, and then Islam has taken over Jerusalem, uh, where the temple used to be. They plonked a mosque at the top, the Dome of the Rock Mosque. Uh, there were also a few churches dotted around which pilgrims would occasionally visit, uh, but it wasn't until the sort of the real concerns about the end of the world, about doomsday, that people began to think, help, if the end of the world is coming, where are we going to see the Antichrist? You know, is there going to be a great plague? Or will there be a famine? Will there be signs in the heavens? And Halley's Comet swings around and, oh no, the end of the world's coming, doomsday's coming. And it becomes a sort of feeble atmosphere. And we've got that a little bit at the moment. And, and that will continue for a while, I'm afraid. History teaches us that. Uh, that around a millennium or around the events of Jesus' death and resurrection, so in 10 years' time, there'll be massive amounts of nonsense uh, expecting Jesus to return. But if we look at what happened a thousand years ago, it's all right. Nobody knows the date all the time. Uh, should we be ready? Absolutely. But should we worry about it? No. People, certainly the Normans and the younger sons who'd gone off rampaging and selling themselves as mercenaries, began to look towards the Middle East as a place to go where they could ply their military prowess, shall we say. And a dirty great war horse, a shire horse covered in, in armour, with a big Norman on top, with a big sword and a, 
a uh, big helm, riding down, or even just ten of them. I mean, they were like tanks. They were very effective, especially if they were given a dispensation. If you die fighting against the infidels, trying to set free Jerusalem so the pilgrims can visit it unmolested, then you go to heaven. And if you kill people, that's all right, because they're wicked anyway. And it was, it was, it was perverted. But people are always happy to believe things that go along with what they think, rather than actually... Jesus doesn't say, get on a great big charger with a big sword or a mace or a lance and go kill people, does he? He says, forgive your enemies. So you have those that, that pray in monasteries and in villages, and those that really take a different approach, which I would say is non-Christian. You could say, well, there is the, the just war theory. How do you respond if you're attacked? Do you stand up and defend the widow and the orphan? Yep. But as I said, when the Normans had been causing trouble in Italy and the Pope had, and the Emperor had sent a delegation over to Constantinople, the Pope, unfortunately, had really let the cat out of the bag. He said, yep, you Normans or you mercenaries from Gaul or you British troops as well, you know, a few Saxon warriors, uh, you get God's blessing, off you go, you can take the cross, put it on your, on your shirts or on your flags, and you receive God's blessing if you do this. And the taking of the cross, a crusade, spent the next sort of 300 years devastating what was the Levant. But not just the Levant. I mean, if you're going to Jerusalem and you're going to kill the enemy and you've set off from England or Germany, and you get halfway down the road and you see some people who are different, well, why don't you start with them? And some of the crusaders were pretty merciless, killing their own people. You know, groups of Jews or uh, groups of people who didn't speak the same language if they lived in Hungary or, you know, and certainly when you got down towards Constantinople, no, can't even say Constantinople, uh, they began to attack towns and villages there. Well, they also didn't have GPS on their phones, you know, to know when they got to Jerusalem. So they would kill anybody in their way, and it was, it was grim. It was messy. It was horrid. Yes, Jerusalem was retaken, but not without an awful lot of bloodshed. And the kingdoms of Jerusalem and Acre and Tyre were established, and Antioch and Edessa, uh, and maintained through warrior monks and those that went over there. But gradually, the armies of the Arabs began to coalesce, and you might remember Saladin. He was very good at coordinating uh, the various tribes, and they fought back against the hodgepodge of crusaders. And they weren't very organized either. I mean, sometimes they'd have a, a good leader, and sometimes they wouldn't. And whilst they were doing that and fighting and killing each other, there were those who said, this is wrong we need to look towards a negotiated peace. And one of those was a man who loved animals. His name was Francis. Francis was raised as a rich man in Italy, uh, raised within the bosom of the church, but he forsook his wealth and became a poor monk. Others joined him, and the Franciscan order of monks grew. Remember, there were the Benedictines from hundreds of years before. But they lived within their communities, like Monte Cassino. Francis and his mates, they'd wander the lanes, they'd talk to people. They'd show the love of God to them in practical ways. They'd draw alongside them and tell the stories of Jesus, which was great. There were others who thought we need to do more teaching. And one of those was Dominic. And the Dominicans began to follow Dominic, and they became a teaching order. They wore different color robes, vestments, cloaks, if you will. Those that followed Francis wore gray the Grey Brothers, the Grey Friars, 
and you will have seen in various places around the country Greyfriars, either Greyfriars churches or occasionally you might have a shopping centre. We don't have Greyfriars in Canterbury, we have Whitefriars who take their name from the Carmelites who come from Mount Carmel. We're not sure about their beginnings uh, but Mount Carmel was where Elijah had a showdown with King Ahab hundreds of years before. But the Carmelites, they wore white, white friars. The Franciscans wore brown, so they became the grey friars. Well, it was probably just a dirty brown, maybe it went brown rather than grey. And the Dominicans have a guess what they were called. But grey friars, white friars, black friars, brilliant. And of course, we have a station in London, black friars, named after Dominicans. Now, they were orders within the church who sought to restore something of the passion of God's love, either through teaching, through engagement directly. Uh, and, and people have done it in different ways for generations, different groups of people. Some of you are Kirsty Easters. Now, you wouldn't say you're followers of Saint Somebody, but you gather for prayer and encouragement and good works, don't you? And that's lovely. Uh, there are always movements within the church. We'll come to these in a, in a couple of weeks. But the Methodists were a group of Christians within the church. The church didn't know what to do with them, so they ended up doing something separate. The Baptists, well, they had their own history. We'll come to that later on. But for the time being, we've got St. Francis, St. Dominic, and we have their impact upon the church. The church has become, this is about the 12th century, quite powerful. We have our font, which sits over there from 1010. In 1206, 1208, John of River emerges. He is the first parish priest of River. Possibly he came from St. Radigan's Abbey, which is up at the top of Minnis Lane. We don't know. There isn't much information about him. You can't go on Wikipedia and find out of John of River, which is all right. But St. Radigan's Abbey had been established about 20 years before. They weren't Franciscan. They weren't Dominican. They also <laughs> weren't Carmelite. They have a long name, which I can't pronounce, which is something like Premonstratan. Thank you, Anne. Uh, and they were an order that came over from France. Uh, the town is already, has the Priory of St. Martin. Yeah, Priory Station. Uh, they were primarily Benedictine. They were linked to the cathedral. So the Premonstratans, the ones that were St. Radigan's, needed to have a place. So they built their establishment at the top of the hill. It's quite bleak. I mentioned that there were also those orders that went to Jerusalem. Yep. There were two particular orders that began to flourish. The Knights of St. John of the Hospital, Hospitallers, and also the Knights of the Temple, the Templars. St. John's Ambulance follows its conclusion from the Knights of the Hospital. The Templars were suppressed, but not before they'd established a base locally, Temple Yule. And the Knights of St. John, well, you've got Temple Yule, which is taken up by them. You've got the Priory in town. You've got the Premonstratans up at the top of the hill. So you have to go all the way out to Swingfield. And you've got St. John's Commandery. So you've got all these different groups close to Dover. Why? Because if you're going on a crusade over to the Middle East, you want to leave that it's got the shortest sea journey, unless you're paying for a vessel all the way round through the Mediterranean, you come through Dover. And Dover becomes not only a, a pilgrim, because we've got the Via Francigena, uh, but we also have, you know, these places that the, the soldiers, the pilgrims could stop off on their way. For those who were perhaps a little bit more impoverished and couldn't stay at the Priory or up at the, the Abbey at the top, a little chapel was built 
just outside the walls of Dover, which is St. Edmund's Chapel. And it was dedicated by St. Richard of Chichester. It's the only chapel in England dedicated to an English saint by an English saint. And over the years, it's been used for lots of different things and it was rebuilt about... 75% of the old sort of stonework and whatever and some of the old wooden uh, oak beams about 50 years ago and it's now used as a a chapel looked after by uh, a little group of trustees. But it's it's there because people would pray on their way either up to visit. Ah, brings me back to Canterbury. Henry II had a good friend and they would go riding together, they'd drink together, they'd probably, I don't know, they'd make jokes together. And when a new Archbishop of Canterbury was needed, Henry said to his friend, Thomas, I think you are the man for the job. And Thomas said, oh, I probably am. And you know the story of Thomas Becket, or, and how... He'd risen to prominence within the court of King Henry. But when he becomes Archbishop of Canterbury and takes the pallium, the sort of the the yoke of Christ Jesus, he says to his friend, I'm serving Christ now. I need to do what the church says, not what you say. And it becomes a little bit awkward for them. And he goes over in exile to France a couple of times and And there's debate between the Pope who offers the the Archbishop of Canterbury's role and Henry says, no, we're England, you know, we make our own decisions, thank you very much. And Henry allegedly says, "Who who will rid me of this turbulent priest? And Thomas gets murdered in the cathedral, doesn't he? And then miracles begin to happen, allegedly. I mean, what is a miracle? Yeah, it's an extraordinary sign. It's not ordinary, but it's extraordinary. It's not natural, it's supernatural. Whether he should have been a saint, I don't know. He was called a saint. I mean, certainly in the New Testament, anyone who follows Jesus is a saint. But we don't all get cathedrals built after us, do we? Uh, Anyway, Thomas is murdered, and fairly soon afterwards, he is acclaimed a saint. And people wanted something different. And so they would go to the site of a saint and they would pray and ask for God's favour. They might want a child, they might want healing, they might want success in business. Whatever reason, they would go and they would travel a long way and they'd come up the Via Francigena from Rome across France and they'd end up coming across the Channel, landing in Dover and there was a grubby looking castle. There was a church that had been there for a while. What date do we reckon that was first built? About seven, eight hundred, Marianne? The church. Yeah. No. Anyway, it's been there for quite a long time, hasn't it? So anyway, people come across the channel. They see a, a bit of a castle and a bit of a church on top of the hill, top of the cliffs, and it looks, it doesn't look very impressive. It's a bit like driving down London Road, driving out of Dover. If you just see the seafront, it looks great, but, you know, it's not quite what it could be. And King Henry thought, you know, I need a decent castle. So he ploughs tons of money, builds this amazing castle. So when people sail across the channel, and even, I mean, you know, they're on their boats, and they can see this great castle, it looks impressive. And then they come up through Dover, and they go to Canterbury, uh, they pray at St. Thomas's Shrine, And then they go back home again thinking, wow, there's a great big cathedral and there's a big castle. England must be a great nation. Um, But, you know, things weren't quite what they seem. Because a few years after, you know, we have Henry and then his sons, uh, King Richard the Lionheart, who was always away fighting in the Middle East, because it was constant battles, really, for 300 years until 1297 when uh, Acre finally falls You know, but 300 years of crusader states and crusades, not bad. Well, it was bad. It wasn't good for anybody, really. But there was constant wars going on all the time, and we're in the middle of a a conflict at the moment, both a cold war and a hot war. Nevertheless, John, 
Richard's brother, takes the throne and he cheeses off everybody, doesn't he? Uh, so much so that the barons revolt, uh, Magna Carta is introduced, a Bill of Rights, you know, saying that, you know, we have freedom, which is great. Unfortunately, John, as well as being weak with his barons, also fell out with the Pope. Why did it matter? Because there was only one church across Europe, including the Celtic church on the fringe uh, in Ireland and in Scotland. They were all sort of caught up in that, more or less. The king had wanted a particular man to be his archbishop, Stephen Langton, and the Pope didn't want him to be. And the Pope had the ecclesiastical authority. King John didn't really have the support of the barons in the country. Uh, and the Pope, anyway, put out a bull closing all the churches in England, which didn't happen until, again, until 2020, when the Archbishop of Canterbury closed our churches again. You think, after 800 years, why did we do that? Anyway, at the time, the Pope closed the churches so there couldn't be any weddings, any baptisms, funerals. I think you could bury people in the churchyard, because people, but any sacraments couldn't be administered, which was grim, you know. And people weren't, weren't going to heaven, because if you weren't baptised, oh dear. And if you're living in sin, you can't be forgiven, oh dear. However, a delegation comes across the channel, comes up through river, comes to Temple Yule, brings a great big vellum scroll, reads it out and says, King John is a very naughty man, but he said sorry and we forgive him and therefore you can open up the churches again. And then they went back to, to Rome and King John's delegation went and told everybody and all the churches open again. Almost what happened after COVID, wasn't it? Not quite. Stephen Langton, as well as being involved in Magna Carta and being Archbishop of Canterbury, was a very clever man. The Bible's, uh, here's a Bible. If you remember that Jerome had translated the Bible into the vulgar language of Latin, the Vulgate, and there are a few codexes that exist, but there are also increasingly in monasteries, people who would copy out the scriptures and make their own versions, which was great. Stephen Langton decided that reading the Bible was quite hard, and it is quite hard, but he thought he'd make it easier. So he introduces verses and chapters, which was very kind of him, because it makes the reading of a book, certainly a long book, much easier. So the next time somebody says to you, John 3.16, John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, we have Stephen Langton to thank. You might say, Stephen Langton? Isn't it Simon Langton? And I will say to you, Simon Langton was the Archdeacon of Canterbury from whom the school gets its name. Stephen Langton was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Have you all fallen asleep? So we're, we're heading, we've done, we've done a few hundred years. Uh, Alfred's burnt the cakes, the Romans have come and gone, the Celtic sort of church has been assumed into the Roman church. Uh, we have bishops, we have priests, we have deacons, we have friars, grey friars, black friars, white friars, uh, happy friars. Isn't that on the corner of uh, Dow Street? Uh, and, and John of River has arrived, and there are various other vicars of River who are listed. Things move east and west around the Mediterranean. Sadly, at the beginning of the 1340s, a new disease breaks out, and it is a horrid disease. It kills people. It doesn't just make them cough and sneeze. It gives them little buboes as well. Uh, bubonic plague, black death, and it spreads with rats and fleas and People catch it. People die. In fact, 
45% of the general population, 30 to 45%, that's, that's massive. That's even more than the projected figures were for COVID before we knew that actually it wasn't a fatal disease. It was, it was more like, if it, even worse than Ebola. And it's still around, bubonic plague, uh, in poor countries. Occasionally it outbreaks in Madagascar where we uh, pray for Bishop Gilbert and the people there because uh, there's a lot of poverty in some of those places. Uh, so the Black Death comes and smites the nation. You lose a workforce. You lose those in the feudal system who are at the top, in the middle and at the bottom. When the Black Death has sort of moved on, workers begin to think, oh, maybe I could uh, sell my, my skills for a little bit more. Maybe I could move out of my village. The only way other than moving out of a village was joining the army. And there wasn't really a standing army. There were sort of groups that would follow the barons or the king occasionally if they were called up. But you would live in your village. You'd know your place. It would be the lord of the manor. You might have a priest or a friar might wander around. Or you might have ventured into one of the medieval cities which weren't large. But it meant there was, there was real churn within society. The Bible, as I said, was in Latin, although you now had chapters and verses, thanks to Stephen Langton. But Latin wasn't the language that people usually use. If I was to say to you, verbum term veritas, uh, or dulce decorum est, um, vini vidi vici, yeah. school motto, uh, I mean, we don't use Latin very much. Occasionally, et cetera, et cetera, we do. Uh, but uh, it's, 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 it's a dead language. Scholars sometimes speak to each other in Latin and accuse each other of not having the right dialect, but we don't, we don't know what Latin sounds like. Uh, we, we have an idea. And the same was true with people 700 years ago. People sort of had a grasp of some of it, they knew something of the language because the services that they went to in their village churches, including the village church here and at St. Margaret's and elsewhere. How old's the church in Shepherdswell, Anne and Terry? I mean, St. Andrew's is, is new, but was there an old one there before? Was there an old one there before? Okay, because obviously we've got Barfriston, which is Norman, haven't we? So it's quite likely that St. Andrew's was old as well. So you had people in the churches who didn't really understand much of what was going on. They might recognize something, and the, the words of dismissal, uh, which includes the word mass, you know, go out into the world and to love and serve. Uh, that, the service takes on the name of that dismissal, mass. Hence Christmas. Uh, anyway, the peasants are revolting. Uh, they're trying to get more money for the work that they, because they know it's a supply and demand culture. Uh, and in the midst of that, you have a man in Oxford called John Wycliffe. And John Wycliffe translates the Bible into English. Thank you, John, because I don't do Latin. I don't do uh, old English either, but I do do modern English. And John Wycliffe's English wasn't quite as modern as what we have today but he translated the Bible primarily into English. And he had some friends and colleagues, and they would also do it. And they would tell the stories that they read in the Scriptures to others, and they would go out, and they would stand in the middle of a village, and they would tell the good news of Jesus. And people would hear it and think, oh, that's what the old priest in the church was trying to tell us last weekend, possibly, other than get more money out of us that we can send to Rome so they can build a great big new church in the middle of Rome. John Wycliffe in reading the Bible and translating it, discovers that there were things going on in the church that shouldn't go on. So, for example, clerical celibacy has always been optional up until about the 11th century. Then it was imposed. But, in spite of it being a demand that priests and bishops and cardinals and popes must be celibate, quite a lot of them had children, and they weren't immaculate. Uh, Things about the poor being honoured and loved. Forgiveness being conditional rather than unconditional. 
Well, you'll be forgiven if you give, you know, you know, 30 candles to the church at Candlemas. Uh, and candles are very important, especially during the winter, to have the church alight. Uh, if you want to have your child baptised, yes, well, you know, cross my palm with silver and uh, we'll get that done. In reading the scriptures, John Wycliffe was able to say, no, this shouldn't be going on. And the people that he taught, who went out to speak in village greens and sometimes town squares, they were called lollards. Some of them were popular, some of them weren't, but they were, they were the men of the people. And they spoke out God's word, and people began to hear something afresh. In fact, one of them, in 1381, uh, a good Kentish priest called John Ball, uh, he was involved in leading the Peasants' Revolt because the, the legislative changes weren't happening. John Ball, if you remember, was the one who said, when Adam dug an Eve span, who was then the gentleman? Good question, still pertinent. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a natural equality to who we are. Why should the Lord be in his manor or in his castle? And why should we be working for him? I don't know. Well, the Bible says Adam and Eve. Oh, interesting. It doesn't say Lord Farquhar of the castle of Sibbertswold should be in control. Oh, interesting. Anyway, so it was... People began to use the Bible to realise that they were being held under a feudal system with the, which, which was broken. So the Lollards went out and, and preached. John Wycliffe, sadly, was uh, subsequently treated as a little bit of a heretic because he was standing against the power and authority of the church. The church, well, any institution doesn't like to be challenged, does it? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes dragged Jesus before the Sanhedrin, falsely accused him, and then took him to Pilate and said, this man deserves to die. And Pilate says, why? What's he done? John Wycliffe, likewise, putting the Bible into people's minds in English rather than in Latin and a language they didn't understand, becomes a heretic. He's burnt and killed. Well, actually, he does die. <laughs> Everybody dies. But uh, he has died, and he's, after his death, he's made a heretic, and they dig up his bones and burn them. And it's just ridiculous. Uh, but this is all happening while the little parishes and villages are still sort of ticking along. The great city of Constantinople finally succumbs to the Turks, the Ottomans, uh, in, 50, in 1453. Finally, the great walls are breached, never again to rise. The order of St. John of the Hospital survive, Rhodes and then Malta, uh, and I say they still exist today, uh, the Knights of St. John, and they can still issue their own passports, I believe. Uh, and if you're part of St. John's Ambulance, you have that heritage as well, that's sort of an offshoot of that. But with the collapse of Constantinople, lots of things were moved westwards, the Venetians and the Genoese, great merchant sailors, brought with them from the wreckage of what was Byzantium books. They bought statues, they bought lovely pots, busts of things. And the Renaissance begins, and people like Erasmus, people like William Tyndall, people like Thomas Cramner, People like Henry VIII begin a new era. So, thank you for listening. That's about a thousand years, give or take a few years, of Christian history. And into the mix of that were ordinary believers, just like you and me. And thank God we speak in English rather than in other languages now. Jesus, we say, was the Word who became flesh. 
the word that became accessible to ordinary people. If it's not accessible, then the gospel means nothing. Accessible through what people can access themselves, but also through our lives. So next week, rather than just being the church in England and Europe, we look at how the church of England begins and what happens next.